I want to say a good morning to all of those that are joining us online today. We are so glad that you are here. And church family, I want you guys to be aware that we have an entire uh, community that uh, joins us online here in the morning. And also, in terms of like on demand, they go back and watch uh, sermon videos as well. And some of these individuals have never even come through the front doors of our church. We have one individual joining us all the way from New York on a regular basis and uh, is becoming connected a little bit more here at Turning Point. And we're just so glad that we get to reach an entire community for Jesus. Amen. We're also thankful for those that are joining us with from the Lilac as well. And let's give a huge Turning Point welcome to all of those that are joining us online. You know, it's uh, pretty amazing. The Lilac crew, they didn't get bacon and pancakes this morning, but they got a lot of donuts. And so we're so thankful that you guys were still able to partake today. Uh, God is doing good things. Amen. I love how we just worship the Lord together. This is the way I view, in terms of our worship time, uh, I connect it to a little bit of some gardening. Every spring... Your, your ground, it's just hard, right? You get out, to your, get out to your garden. How many guys are gardeners in here? Okay. We managed to kill most of our plants, so we're still learning. Okay. So, but you get out in the spring and everything, the soil is packed and it is hard. And then all of a sudden you're out there having to till it and, 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 and lift up that ground and then be able to plant the seeds. Okay. You guys know what I'm talking about? That's what I feel like every Sunday is. Sometimes our week has a way of just packing our soil. Life has a way of making it just a little difficult. But when we worship together, when we worship, that worship is like an awesome tiller. And it's just helping Loosen the ground so that way the word of God is planted in our hearts. Amen? Amen. So, just want to mention a couple of things this morning. We are, of course, continuing our series on, this is our last one of our three-week series on fresh air. And I just put on there, plus fresh word. Okay, because I, there's going to be a fresh word that I believe that the Lord is wanting to share this morning with each and every one of us. But before we get into that, I just have a couple of things I want to make announcements around Tuesday night. If, uh, if you are a man, a young man, an older man, a middle-aged man, we would love for you to come and be a part of our new men's initiative that's going to be happening uh, starting next, or this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. Say 7 p.m., men. 7. Okay, I love that. Bass, deep voice. Okay. 7 p.m. All right. And we're going we're gonna to have some treats there, uh, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, no bacon, but we'll probably have some donuts or something that we can eat. But we're going to begin a long, uh, 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 about a 16-week study, and it sounds long, but I'll tell you what, it is packed full of wonderful biblical uh, character and teaching. And we're going to be talking about how, what it means to be a man of purity and a man of character and how to lead your family. And so we're going to be going through that together. Both Richard Hall and I are going to be co-leading that. So that's happening. The orientation's at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Men, I would love for you to come and be a part of that. Also, we're launching our Mexico missions trip to our Go Missions team. That's going to be happening in the month of June, we're going to be going to Nogales, Mexico, and there's going to be a wonderful uh, a variety of different ministry opportunities. We're going to be going to women's prison, orphanage, a uh, number of different feeding programs as well. We're partnering up with our missionaries there in Nogales, and we'd love for you to consider praying about going with us. It's going to be, like I said, happening towards the later part of June. You can find all the information for that trip on our website at tpob.org. 
And then young adults, if you are also a junior, senior in high school and are young adults, uh, we're going to be having a prayer and worship service tonight at 5 p.m. in the youth room. Love for you to come and be a part of that. So starting next Sunday, I'm kicking off a new series called Satisfied. We're going to be talking about what it means to learn to be content in all things. How many, of, how many of you would say sometimes you struggle with the area of contentment? Okay. So don't, don't just come alone. Bring a friend, someone you know that may struggle with that as well. And we'd love to just take some time and go through the scripture and what God is calling us in the area of contentment and what it means to be satisfied. We're going to be talking about satisfaction around money around, um, we're going to be talking about relationships, around your job and what you do. And so uh, please come and be ready to receive, uh, because I believe God is going to do some incredible things through this next series. So this is our sermon thesis for our, our current series, series on fresh air. And it is the gospel has the power to bring us hope, renewed strength, and contentment even in difficult times. How many of you would say that we're in difficult times? Yeah, we are in difficult times. The gospel has the power to bring hope and strength and contentment. I love that. Our scripture verse for our sermon series is found in Romans 12, 12, and it says, rejoice in our confident hope. Who is our confident hope? Oh, man. Let's do it one more time. Who's our confident hope? Jesus. Jesus Jesus is our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Keep on praying. We're just culminating out of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I love that we've been able to just break fast together around pancakes and bacon. Oh my goodness, bacon. Some of you guys snuck in, some of you guys snuck in bacon this morning in cups. And I won't name, I won't name your name, Jan, but um, <laughs> so for some of you, you guys may be even eating bacon as I speak this morning. So I want to have you, I just want to encourage you guys to open up your Bibles. If you have your, your physical Bible in front of you this morning, you could take out your tablets or your iPhone, or you can follow along with me on the screen today. Um, but we're going to be uh, hopping into a section of scripture in Matthew. And this is a section of scripture I really believe that the Lord has a fresh word for us right now, for this year. So we're going to be hopping in there, and it's, it, it's actually in the message translation. And so I want you to uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And it says here, walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew. And they were fishing and throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, come with me. I'll make you a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. I love that. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed. I want us to focus a little bit on the word simply. For both Peter and Andrew, they they didn't ask any questions, but they simply dropped their nets and followed Jesus. And this is a word that I've been really chewing on over the last couple of months and certainly during our 21 days of prayer. Simply. Simply. The dictionary definition of simply is in a straightforward or plain manner. I I get the sense that some people, some people uh, may have created even excuses or rationale as to why we can't simply follow Jesus. Sometimes God has called us to drop our nets and he's asked us just to simply follow him. But there may be for some of us in this room or for some of us that are joining us online that we have created excuses 
and reasons as to why we can't completely drop our nets and follow Jesus. And God is calling us to follow him. We pile up even sometimes really good excuses, and at other times we have pretty lousy excuses as to why we can't. But God is just simply asking us to follow him. On the other side of the same coin, we maybe even overcomplicated our journey with God. Following Jesus is simply loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor. Simply loving God and loving people. And we may have even overcomplicated that. So just kind of tease it out a little bit this morning. I want us to focus in on just some key words and phrases that I believe will help generate a little bit of understanding of what I mean around this word simply. And these are words and phrases that our staff, our leadership team, things that have been kind of the Lord has been placing in the hearts of our people. So I want to share just a few of them with you this morning. Simply, just believe. Just believe. Just trust that the Lord is going to take care of all your needs. Here's another one. Simply listen. Oftentimes, we are in such a hurry to speak, to defend, to articulate our opinion, our position, and God is just saying, I want you to just simply listen. Simply love. God has called us to a place of love. And sometimes we are only comfortable loving people that are very much like us. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's easy to love people that are a lot like us and think like us. But God is calling us to just simply love people. Simply be at peace with others. How many of you guys would say that there's a lot of tension over the last three years, four years? (laughs) <laughs> Lots of tension. Simply be at peace with others. Simply speak truth. Sometimes, sometimes we just shy away from speaking the truth. Well, that's not love either. God's called us to speak truth, but to do so with gentleness and with respect. Simply speak truth. Simply extend grace. I know I need grace. I know that all of you need grace. And sometimes we hold back grace from others. Extend it. Simply receive grace. For some of us, it's very difficult to receive grace from another individual. Because we're still struggling to receive grace from our Heavenly Father. Simply forgive. Simply reconcile. God's called us into the area of reconciliation. Simply be joyful. Some of the most um, grouchy and crabby individuals on the planet may be Christians. And God's called us to be the most joyful people. We have the greatest hope of the world, right? Amen. Amen. We should be the most joyous group of people. I'm actually preaching to myself here. My wife can testify. Sometimes I have my crabby moments as well. How many guys are a recovering crabby person? Okay. Simply be joyful. Simply more of him. Man. We sang this song this morning, and and, and honestly, fresh wind. I want more of God, more of God. And sometimes we think that we have arrived, that we've got everything that we need from God, and he's like, he surprises us. There's a whole new levels to our creator. 
simply more of him. Simply give him glory and thanks. There are things that happen. There's a story that Dan Delamater over here just gave testimony to, and we had him come in and share his story. But he was giving God thanks, and I love that. Because there are things that happen where it's just a God thing. And sometimes we hold it back. We need to give God glory. Simply be transformed by the power of God. Simply give thanks. Simply Jesus. That's it. Simply, in a straightforward, in a plain way, it's all about Jesus. Amen? So that's going to be a key word that we're going to be weaving in and out of our messaging over the next several months. But simply doesn't mean easy. It does not mean easy. Simply means following Jesus without excuses. And sometimes we, we have reasons and very good reasons for the things that we do. But God is calling us to lay aside our excuses. The first disciples left behind everything to follow Jesus. This morning, I'm going to be taking time to talk about what it means to move from what was to what is. To simply remind us that as Jesus followers, that we have left behind something. We have left behind an old nature. And that God has made us anew in Jesus. There's this incredible section in Ephesians. This is where we're going to be hopping into this morning. In Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to go there, you can go to verse 10 right away. Um, But just to give you a little bit of some cultural understanding. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus was rivaling other cities like Corinth and Antioch. um, uh, Such cities as um, Rome as well. But Ephesus housed the temple Artemis, the temple of Diana. And it it was a weird situation. There was temple prostitution and horrific things that were coming out of Artemis. But the ancient Greek culture, just to give you a little bit more context around this, the ancient Greek culture despised things like meekness, humility, self-sacrifice, gentleness, the very things that Jesus was all about. The Greek culture despised that, felt like it was weak and definitely unbecoming of a man. But the gospel of Jesus challenged the culture of that day, and it continues to challenge the culture of today. So let's hop into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You're new. You are a new creation in Christ. What I love about the masterpiece is that you are unique. You're one of a kind. Okay? And and oftentimes we connect it to our fingerprints. There's no other fingerprints like that. But just on Friday, I went and saw the eye doc. And yes, I still have bad vision. Uh, So I have to, my my vision is getting worse and worse in my 40s. Um, How many of that's happened to you? Like they said that I'm going to probably in about two or three years need to get little readers. Uh, So yay. Yay for getting older. And so... But my doctor, he took these snapshots, I've never seen this before, in this machine, and they could see my entire eye, okay? Every single optic nerve. They could see uh, the center, the light, the, the imagery of my eye. And my doc said, who is a Christian, by the way, he said, it's so incredible, the design of God. He said that the eye is way more unique than our fingerprints, he said that there's, no, there's, there's not only is it unique in terms of the optic nerves because of the layout and where the blood vessels go, but he goes, every coloring is unique. Every single eye has unique coloring. I thought, man, 
Isn't that something like God to just say, and I want to create you as a masterpiece? Really, it is incredible. So to really appreciate this verse, we're going to go ahead and take time to exegete the the previous nine verses. Before, before we do that, I'm just going to take a moment and just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we dig into his word. Father, we come before you, and we are so thankful for your living and active and authoritative word. We're so thankful that when we open up your word, that it has the power to transform us. We're so thankful that you speak to us through your living word. And Father, right now, this morning, we pray that our hearts would be open to receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen, amen. So the the very first part of this, actually there's two pictures here that the Apostle Paul is going to be painting in these 10 verses in Ephesians chapter 2. And the first part is the before Christ. How many of you guys have a before Christ story? Okay, Every one of us should have a before Christ story. For some of us, it's G-rated. It's like Disney level. Man, that's awesome. I love that, okay? For some of us, we start getting a little in the PG-13 and rated R, okay? And, but yet, God has redeemed. I love that. He has made whole. And so, so there's this before moment with Christ, and that's verses 1 through 3, which we're going to get into. Then there's this, and, and for everyone in this room, we have all had a before Jesus moment. So did the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, and John. Every single person who's put their faith in Christ has had a before moment. And then we're going to take some time in verses 4 through 7. We're going to talk about the after experience with Christ. And then the Apostle Paul brings it all together in verses 8 through 10. So let's go ahead and begin to hop into our text this morning. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Oh, that was it. Okay, yikes. Uh, I'm a little messed up this morning. My clicker remote's not working. So here's what I want you to uh, look at here, is that all of you were dead, and I want you guys to turn to your neighbor and say, you were dead. You were dead. Okay, good. (laughs) <laughs> you were dead. So what does the Apostle Paul mean here? We're talking about a spiritual death, a physical death. What he's talking about is our old life is dead. It was dead. We were dead spiritually. We were enslaved to sin. Uh, we were objects of wrath. Uh, and this translation is that we were subject to God's anger, that we were enslaved by sin we walked among the disobedience, uh, the disobedient, and we were under the devil's rule. So those are the things that the Apostle Paul is talking about, and that's what he's addressing here in Ephesians 1, uh, 2, 1 through 3. But there's a couple of things I want us to talk about as we tease this out a little bit. Just a couple of observations. The very first one is this, that if we understand what God saved us from, we gain a greater appreciation and a love for our Heavenly Father. If you take time to remember what God saved you from, there's just this overwhelming appreciation and joy. If I were to have a conversation with every single one of you, what did God save you from? And you took the time to share your story with me. I think, I think what would happen is that there would be tears. There would be tears of joy. There would be tears of, man, 
just the awesomeness of our heavenly Father. He has saved us from much. Amen? Amen. Number two, we learn to conduct ourselves as people who live on this earth saved by grace. Man, I love that. And ones that have received his mercy, his mercy and his grace. How can I be angry at people that when, when I too once lived among the disobedient, when I too lived among those that were subject to God's wrath and anger, that I too was craving the sinful nature and following his desires and thoughts. I shouldn't have anger to those that are completely unchurched, have no faith background at all, but only should have empathy. Amen? That when we remember what we've been saved from, we should only grow with greater levels of empathy and grace. We should grow with an abundance of love. How can a former object of wrath have anything other than compassion for those that are present objects of wrath? You know, those passions that the Apostle Paul was talking about, I battle them today. That I too once was ruled by them and so were you. So were you. And for some of us this morning, the passions that, uh, and the sinful nature that the Apostle Paul is talking about, for some of us, we may even still be trapped. And God is calling us to places of freedom today. We're going to continue on here. So here's a question I want to ask you this morning. Why is this so important for us to remember that we were at one time dead? That we were at one time dead. Here's a couple of thoughts. One, it reminds us that the old life had nothing to offer us. Man, it had nothing. There were these grandiose promises that came from that old life. Oftentimes, it ended up with broken promises, hurt, pain, addiction. The old life had nothing to offer us. And the second thing, there are many people we know that are spiritually dead to their sin and need to be offered the greatest answer of hope. Of hope. How many of you guys know people that are spiritually dead? We were at one time that way. But we get to offer the greatest answer of the hope of Christ. Here are a few observations that I want us to just kind of take a deep dive in, in terms of Ephesians chapter 2. It says here that once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now, the unseen world is associated with a realm of Satan, the way of life without Christ in accordance to the rule of Satan's ways. 1 John 5, 19 really addresses this as we know that as children of God, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Here's the third verse. It says that all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. All of us to, used to live uh, by means to have, uh, like, for instance, um, uh, we used to live really is addressing how we used to previously walk in our sin, in death. In other words, the things we have done to bring anger on of God upon us was done by our nature. We need a savior. How many of you would say, I need a savior? I need a savior. And it's because that because of our nature, 
It brought God's anger on us. And because of that, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to be able to be our great rescue plan. We are by nature sinners. So what would your life look like without Christ? I want you to think about that for just maybe a few seconds here. Probably wouldn't take long to think about how messed up your life would look like if you didn't have Christ. I probably would be divorced, or I think of all of the potential addictions the Lord saved me from, probably being in the middle of all of that. I don't know if I would be a good dad. Think about it. Because you said yes to Jesus, he changed everything. He changed it all. Our need for a savior segues us into these next few verses. The first part was all really about our old life, our old nature. And much like the early disciples, we too had an old life. One that was entangled by the snares of this world. So the second part of the scripture, we're going to be focusing on the new life. I want you guys to say new life. New life. The new life. Now we are alive. Every one of us is made new in Christ for those that have said yes to him. Here's a few thoughts when we talk about the new life. Now we are enthroned, which means that we are crowned with the crown of righteousness from God. Now, now we are objects of grace. Instead of being objects of God's anger, we are objects of God's grace. We now have fellowship with Christ and with one another. And there is union with our heavenly father. And so, do you begin to see how utterly horrible life is without Christ? It is very tough. When you think about this question, what would your life look like without Jesus? I don't even want to imagine what my life would be like. But let's go ahead and hop in to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. But God is so rich in mercy And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Love was God's motivation. Love was God's motivation. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. Through faith. It is not faith that saves you. Faith faith is simply saying yes. It is putting your trust and your hope in who Jesus is. But it is by grace you have been saved. You are only saved by the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice that he did on that cross. That's the only way that you are saved. Faith is the hand that reaches out and receives what is given. Grace shows us that all the work has been done by Jesus. All the work. There's nothing that you can do in order to receive the gift of God's grace. So the difference between grace and mercy. Mercy is God not not giving you what you deserve, but grace is God giving you what we don't deserve. Salvation, eternal life. Adoption, spiritual riches. Our grace is simply based on what Christ has done for us. Many, many years ago, I was interning at a church in Sandpoint. And wonderful, wonderful small uh, church. Uh, They uh, really uh, knew how to worship the Lord and are very thankful. And that's where I got... Uh, radically saved, and I was called into ministry, and, and so I was doing an internship at this church over the summer, and they put me in charge of the building, the facility, and I'm 20 years old, I think, at the time, and so I'm 20 years old, I'm in charge of this facility, and I'm also in charge of the Sunday morning. So it's a Thursday late afternoon, and I'm about ready to head out, okay, And so I decide, uh, this may be TMI, but I decided to go to the bathroom 
and um, I'm using the urinal, okay? You're probably thinking, wow, Pastor Josh, where are we going with this story? <laughs> but I'm using the urinal and flush and quickly go and wash my hands, okay? And then I'm out, okay? Lock up the building, I'm out of there. I didn't know that the urinal handle got stuck, okay? So you can probably see where this story is going. So it's a Thursday. I didn't show up until Sunday morning. And uh, I, <laughs> I'm really confused why we have all of our elders and leaders and they're carrying bucket after bucket of water out of our basement. And uh, so it probably went up to here, maybe, uh, uh, in terms of water. And uh, some pumps stopped working at the same time. So, so nothing was getting pumped out. And so, uh, he, you know, just you see the drum cage floating uh, in the basement, electric guitars floating. So it was a lot. Cost the church a lot of money. I'm an intern. And I'm thinking, they're going to kill me. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame them. And, uh, and so what they did is they said, we want to bless you. We want to bless you. Never come back again, but we want to bless you. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching online uh, from Sam Point, God bless all of you guys for, <laughs> for your grace and for your mercy. But they truly just blessed me. They end up taking care of a bunch of my schooling and, and, and paid for it all. And so I'm incredibly thankful for them. But this is a great story of showing both grace and mercy. Here's this punk intern coming in and destroys the place. <laughs> and they were so, so kind about it, so gentle. I would love to be a fly on the wall, though, in those board meetings. Man. <laughs> So moving on here, we see this moment also in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and it says, For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us, seated you, seated me with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. And I love that. I'm just going to read that again because I feel like some of you are just, you need to know this. For he raised us from the dead. You were raised from the dead along with Christ Jesus and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. And can I get a big amen? Amen. amen. So what does it mean to be seated with Christ. Well, it's simply what well, we find, where we, wherever we find Jesus seated, we're along there with him. And the great answer can be found in Psalm 1. And it says this in Psalm 1, 1. If I can get there with my remote. There we go. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. We don't want to sit there. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. To be in the center of who God is, is to be able to say, God, I am going to meditate on you and upon your word day and night. I want to be able to be in the center of you. And we are united with Christ, and his word is living and active, and it speaks to us, church. So God, this is what I love about in, in our continuing verse here. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. So the appropriate expression of God's love to those who are spiritually dead is to give them life. That is God's appropriate response. It's that he wants to give you life. 
This is the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. It is his kindness that he allows us to sit with him in the heavenly realms someday. And then he, continuing in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, God saved you by his grace when you believed. He saved you by his grace when you said yes to him. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God, which means that you cannot work for this. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. What he's saying here is don't be prideful. Don't make it about you. Christians live and die dependent not on what they do for God, but on the grace of God. Salvation is God's gift and can never be earned. The most important things in life is experiencing God's forgiveness. How many of you guys experience God's forgiveness? Amen. So thankful for God's forgiveness. A right relationship with him. Acceptance into God's beautiful family. Eternal life with him someday. Spiritual understanding as we continue to read God's word. That, that the goal is that, that God would continue to reveal himself to you through what you read. The transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the power of the Holy Spirit has the ability to renew the way you think and transform the way you live. The promise of God's blessings now and forever. So in return, we as Jesus followers should live knowing that we belong to God. We belong to God. You were bought with a high price. That should joyfully and loudly give us great praise to our Heavenly Father. We should be the loudest people on the earth. And like I mentioned earlier, the most joyful people on this planet. You will face many trials and many tribulations and many, many troubles in this world. But take heart, for I have overcome. Amen? Let us be the most joyful group of people. Let's be the loudest group of people. Joy and thanksgiving are the appropriate response. There's many, many troubles and things that I, I hear every day as your pastor. And it grieves me, some of the things that your guys are going through. It really does. It grieves me in my moments of counseling with you as I hear your stories and the things that have happened to you. It grieves me. But take heart, for Jesus has overcome. So much promise right there. Joy and thanksgiving are the appropriate response to God's grace. Joy, thanksgiving, and grace are all related words in the Greek. Everything in this life and the next hangs on grace. What I love here in Isaiah, it says this. The people, and this is the prophet Isaiah. He was literally speaking about the future Messiah. And he says this. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And that is the hope of the world. His name is Jesus. Hope came and continues to redeem a world that is completely lost. And we were a part of that at one time. And Jesus gives us this most sober warning and the most encouraging hope in the next couple of scriptures I'm going to share with you. Here's the warning. It says here in Matthew 23, 27, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Wow, 
Jesus. Talk about simply telling the truth here. I don't want to be a whitewashed tomb. I don't want us to come to church on a Sunday morning and have everything on our exterior put together while our interior is a wreck. For some of us, we may feel like we can put on this mask or this face. And it's a face saying, I got it all put together. I'm good. That's not what God's called us to. He wants us to deal with our interior world. He wants us to deal with this, with our hearts. He doesn't want us to be hypocrites, but he wants us to be transformed on the inside out. Amen? Here's the most encouraging hope that God gives us in this next section of Scripture. John 5, 24 through 25. This is this, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message, and I'm praying that you're listening to God's message today. Those that listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they will have already passed from death into life. And I'm so incredibly thankful that when, that when we put our faith and our hope in Christ, that we pass from the old nature, from death into life. And that he has given us something called abundant life. A life filled with promise, a life filled with hope. And it goes on here in the next uh, verse. And then I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now. When the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. Those who put, open up their spiritual ears to be able to listen to the God's, God's calling and His leading in people's lives, when they say yes to Jesus, they live. And for some of us in this room, we've really questioned, we've had these moments of doubt, like, am I saved? Have you put your faith and your hope in Jesus? And yes, then fully receive the gift of grace and salvation. Amen? And receive it with faith. God is wanting to do a deep work in all of our hearts. So we are going to culminate in Verse, or at verse 10, it says that for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. He's created you anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. The new is here. So here's my bottom line that I want to share for you as we wrap up this morning, as we wrap up this series. Remember that at one time you were lost, enslaved by all kinds of sins and darkness, and Jesus interrupted your life. I'm so thankful that Jesus interrupted my life when I was 16 years old. I was trapped in such horrible things. And Jesus came in and he interrupted and he said, Josh, there's a new way. There's a way of life. And I want to invite you to simply follow me. And I said, yes. He's calling you out to follow him. And all you have to do is simply say yes. Never forget what he has saved you from. And your story matters because... Others are living in darkness that need to know the story of the hope that you have. And all too often, we are holding on to our stories. And God is saying, listen, I've given you a story that I want you to share. Story of hope, story of transformation, story that is filled with Jesus. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Oh, Father, we thank you so much, Lord, 
for your goodness, for your grace, and for your mercies. We're so thankful that you have created us anew and that you have, you have transformed us. Lord, for those that have put their faith and their hope in you, Lord, may we just be reminded that we were bought with a high price and that there's nothing that we can do to be able to earn the gift of grace and the gift of salvation. It is a free gift. But Lord, this morning, I just pray for those right now that may be struggling with the old sinful nature. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would speak to hearts today. Lord, that you would do a transformative work in those areas. If you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Josh, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with letting go of some of that old nature. Letting go and letting God be able to do what he does best in bringing in freedom and healing into those areas. If you're here this morning, you would say, could you just pray for me? Pray that I be reminded that I am new in Christ and that he has given me victory over sin. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. Yeah, many hands, many hands this morning. Hmm. If you're here this morning and you would say, I haven't said yes to Jesus. I haven't simply let down my nets and followed him. And I'm still dead to my sin. If you're here this morning and you would say, I want that kind of hope and life I want to live for Jesus. If you want to receive the free gift of grace and salvation this morning, I'd love for you just to raise your hand. I want to pray for you as well today. Go ahead and just boldly and courageously lift up your hand this morning. Thank you. For all of those that are joining us online, you can indicate that in the chat as well. But we would love to be able to pray for you. Lord, I'm so thankful that you are the one who has given us victory over sin. And that, Lord, that when we said yes to you, that you have, that you have encouraged and you have given us life. And Lord, that you have made us new in you. And God, that we are more than conquerors in you. And Lord, for those that are in this room and those that are maybe joining us online or from Lilac this morning and they're still struggling with the old sinful nature, Lord, that, that we would be reminded that those things are dead. That we are now new in you. And Lord, that you would give us the power of your Holy Spirit to be able to walk in victory each and every day. And Lord, that we can be able to keep our eyes fixed upon you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And Lord, that you would give us strength as we walk with you. Lord, for those that have made a decision to say yes to you today, putting their faith and their hope in you, God, I pray that you would rock the, their world. I pray for a deep spiritual transformation to take place. Lord, we are so thankful that we are made new in you. And that we receive the incredible gift of grace and salvation and that your mercies are new each and every day. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's give God praise this morning, church family. Just want to let you guys know of a couple of quick next steps that you can take because we are all on a spiritual journey, so I don't want you tuning out. Sometimes when I talk about spiritual next steps, we may think, well, that's not for me. When in reality, it may be very well for you. I want to encourage you to think about signing up for water baptism. If you made a decision for Jesus and never have walked out, 
your next step in water baptism. I encourage you to do that. You can go to tpob.org and you can sign up under spiritual next steps. Also, next week, we're starting off a brand new step one of our growth track. Growth track is an important next step that I encourage you to take. It's three steps. The first one is understanding our vision, our mission, our culture, and what we are about here at Turning Point Church. So that's step one. Step two is discovering your God-given design. You have been made uniquely. There are spiritual gifts and personality tests that we take you through. The third one, the third step, the third week is all about joining our team. We have 25 unique teams here at Turning Point. We would love for you to join that and be a part of making a difference in the world, both locally and globally. Amen? Okay, at this time, I'm going to call forward our uh, dream team, our ushers, as we receive this morning's tithes and offerings. I just want to say thank you so much for your continued generosity as you give faithfully to the Lord. Many of you are giving online in reoccurring gifts, and so thank you so much for doing that. Uh, some of you love to give through cash and check. Thank you. Not only does it keep the, the lights on in our building and pay for our staff, but as we look at our budget, the governing board looks at every dollar that is spent and how we can truly make a difference with our community partners, as we make a difference with our missionaries around the world, as we continue to find ways to help advance God's kingdom here on earth. So as you give, I want you to know every dollar is prayed for. Every dollar is uh, continued to, to just it, bathe it in prayer and ask God for wisdom on how to help use that for God's kingdom purposes. Will you join me as we pray a blessing upon this morning's tithes and offerings? Lord, we are so thankful for the faithful generosity of every gift and giver this morning. We pray blessings upon it. Lord, we're thankful for an opportunity to be able to worship you with our money today. Lord, you don't need money, but what you're helping us do is prioritize those important things in our lives. So with our first fruits, with our ties today, we say yes to you, God. We trust you. We know that, God, that you are going to multiply it for your kingdom effort and impact. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You can drop off your connection card in there as the offering is going around this morning. You can stand to your feet this morning, and we are going to close in one final song. God bless you, everyone. <laughs>